Good morning. So recently, my son James and I, we have started playing a video game. Uh, it's called New Super Mario Brothers Wii. Uh, I played a lot of video games as a kid, um, probably most definitely too much, um, but it's so much fun to be able to enjoy those things with my son now. And as James and I have gotten into this game, this, this Mario game, uh, my wife Whitney and I, we were talking about how when we were kids, you could buy these strategy guides. Uh, they, they're called Nintendo Power uh, that took you step by step through a video game. Uh, yes, I, I, I realize I've just dated myself. Uh, if you are a, a child or, or, or student and, and play games, this is obviously before YouTube existed. Um, we had to go to magazines for such things, not online tutorials. Um, but these guides, these Nintendo Power Guides, what they did was they gave you tips as you played the game. They showed you where special items might be hidden. They helped you learn how to beat each level. And importantly, uh, they helped you avoid the bad guys and beat the bosses. So it's not difficult to see why that would be incredibly helpful. Warning you about the location of enemies and exposing the weaknesses of those enemies. Now, that's similar to what's going on in our passage uh, that we're studying this morning. The Apostle Paul is writing to a group of Christians, and he is warning them about false teaching that's confronting them and shining the light on its weaknesses and its dangers. So we are currently in a series in Paul's letter to the Colossians called Christ Over All. By that, I mean two things. One, Jesus is supreme. Jesus is king over all. All things were created through him and for him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He is above all earthly powers. And by God's grace, he rules over us. Jesus is not just king, he is my king, he is your king, he is our king. And that means that he calls the shots. We must, by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, bring our lives into greater and greater conformity with his will. So Jesus is supreme. Jesus is also sufficient. That's the second meaning. He is over and above all supposed means to advance us in our faith and bring us near to God. Jesus is enough. He's all we need. Adding anything to Jesus takes away from Jesus. If we want to know God, if we want to be at peace with him, if we want to grow in our obedience to him, all we need is Jesus. We need to cling to him. We don't need to look elsewhere. In fact, it would be spiritually disastrous to do so. The recipients of Paul's letter, the Christians uh, in a town called Colossae, they needed to hear these things. They had received the gospel. They had believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. A man named Epaphras, who was a native of Colossae, had shared it with them. And the gospel was bearing fruit among them. But it does seem like they were also being confronted by false teaching. Now, we've, we've, we've touched on the nature of that false teaching in previous sermons, but this morning we're going to see it in more detail. Uh, in our passage today, it's Colossians 2, verses 6 through 23, Paul more directly addresses the heresy confronting the Colossian Christians. And he not only tells them to run from it, but he also emphasizes how in Christ, the Colossian Christians already have, or in Christ they already have um, what the false teaching promised to give. The false teaching is full of empty promises. It's promising things they already have in Jesus, and Paul wants them to see that. Listen to a man named uh, one commentator, R.C. Lucas, unpack the claims of this heresy. He puts it like this. The new teaching had an immediate appeal just because it spoke to a real need. It urged upon these young Christians the challenge of fullness of spiritual life and experience. It called upon them to be satisfied with nothing less than a life free from the stain and tyranny of sin. It pointed the way to a zeal of devotion that put to shame all complacence or half-heartedness. 
It spoke of the need to get out of the shallows and open the heart and mind to the deep things of God. It made much both of leaving the rudimentary stages of spirituality and of the possibilities of swift advance to a wider understanding. Now, those are good impulses and desires, right? The problem is that the false teaching is trying to meet those needs apart from or in addition to Jesus. And what Paul emphasizes is the deficiency of that teaching and the fact that the Colossians already have all they need in Christ. And so this is a word, not just for the Christians at Colossae, but I think it's a word also for us. We'll see that, I hope, this morning as we work through our text in three points. Now, the first one's gonna be walk in Christ Jesus the Lord. The second uh, will be first warning and correction. And the third will be second and third warnings and corrections. And we'll go through each of these in turn. So first, walk in Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, earlier in Colossians 2, 1 to 5, Paul expresses his desire for the Colossians and other Christians who haven't seen him in person. And here's what he says. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, Yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. So evidently the Colossians hadn't bought into the false teaching and Paul wants it to stay that way. He wants them to remain guarded against the plausible false arguments they're hearing. He rejoices to see their good order and the firmness of their faith in Christ. And now, in verse 6, he says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Jesus is the Christ. He's the long-awaited Messiah who came to save his people from their sins. Jesus is the Lord. He is God in the flesh. He is king over all. And the Colossians had received him. They had received Christ Jesus the Lord. He was their king. Paul now calls them to walk in Christ as they received him. They must keep on following their Lord and King. And he explains it further in verse 7. It's important to point out here that based on the original text, the verse could possibly be translated like this. Having been rooted and being built up in him, and being established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So here, four characteristics describe what it means to walk in Christ Jesus the Lord. The first three all have something in common. They're passive. Having been rooted, being built up, being established in the faith. Think about what this means, about what it implies. God is the one at work here. By his grace, the Colossian Christians have been like a plant rooted in Christ. By his grace, they were like a building being built up in him. And by his grace, they were being established, being made firm in their faith just as they were taught. Yes, they need to keep on clinging to Jesus, to keep on trusting him, to keep on following him and submitting to his kingly rule. But there's the assurance that God has done the rooting. God is doing the building and God is doing the establishing. It's all grace. It's all from start to finish a work of God. The false teaching that confronted the Colossians, as we'll see in a moment, may have included the claim that the Colossians' faith was incomplete, that they needed to abstain from certain things and participate in others in order to know God and be pleasing to him. This word from Paul would just obliterate that, right? The Colossians didn't need new teaching. 
they didn't need to look outside or beyond Christ for fulfillment and growth. They had received Christ Jesus, the Lord, and as they received him, they needed to walk in him, having been rooted and being built up in him and being established in the faith just as they were taught. And then finally, the fourth characteristic, abounding in thanksgiving. Is it any wonder that thanksgiving comes at the end of this list? In light of God's grace to them, what else could they do but give thanks? This too would have been a wonderful guard uh, for them from the false teaching. As um, David Garland says, those who bubble over with gratitude for what God has already done are not easy prey to anxiety and doubt. They have no need or desire to look for fulfillment elsewhere and cannot be taken in by false promises or shaken by bigoted detractors. So Bethel and, and anyone who's watching this morning who is trusting Jesus, as we received Christ Jesus the Lord, let's walk in him. Let's keep on trusting him. Let's keep running from sin, following him, submitting to his kingly rule. And let's remember what God has done for us and is doing in us. By grace, we have been rooted in Jesus. We are safe and secure in him. By God's grace, we are being built up in him. God is day by day, more and more, moment by moment, making us into the likeness of Jesus. And rest assured, he will finish what he started. And by God's grace, we are being established. We are being made firm in the faith, just as we were taught. This is wonderfully good news. And so let's be abounding as well in thankfulness for what God has done for us and is doing for us and in us. Ray Ortland, he helps paint this picture another way that I think is helpful. Picking up on Paul's command, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. He says this, Christian living goes by the same ground rules as Christian conversion. Justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, apart from all our works, that's how we enter. That's how we live. We never advance beyond grace. We never graduate to deeper things. Sanctification gets traction from the positive energy of justification. When you came into Christ, the whole flow of your life reversed. You crossed the continental divide from self-justification with all its painful complications to grace justification with all its happy freedom. Don't cross back. The whole flow of your life is grace. Enjoy it moment by moment. Man, that's such good news. God has done in Christ great things for us. He has justified us. He has declared us righteous in Christ. Not guilty, but righteous instead. He is sanctifying us day by day, making us more and more into Christ's image. And it's all a work of grace. So let's rejoice in it. As Ray Ortland says, let's enjoy it moment by moment. From here, Paul moves on and he gives three specific warnings to the Colossians. Let's look at the first one and the correction Paul provides. So in verse 8, and this is the first warning, Paul starts to address the false teaching at Colossae, and he describes it in several ways. Look with me at the verse. Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. Now, by that, Paul isn't condemning the branch of philosophy as we know it. The term had a broader meaning than that in Paul's day. Instead, he's warning about the philosophy, a specific teaching that's confronting the Colossian Christians. He goes on, empty deceit. Whatever this false teaching was, it was void and deceptive. It couldn't really help the Colossians in their walk with Christ, but only lead them in the wrong direction. According to human tradition, the heresy being taught had its roots 
in human tradition, not that all human tradition is necessarily bad or evil, but that here it's an error because it, Paul says, came from man, not from God. According to the elemental spirits of the world. Now, it's possible here that Paul is referring to evil spirits. If that's the case, he's calling the false teaching out not simply as man-made, but demonic. It's possible that he is referring to the materials that make up the universe and the false gods that people associated with them as well, though. And Douglas Moo, he explains what may be going on if that's the case. Listen to him. He says, The Colossian philosophy, by its preoccupation with rules and material things, was, in Paul's view, treating them like the pagans did, as if they were fundamental cosmic powers that needed to be placated. They were, in effect, putting them in the place of Christ and failing to recognize that believers had died to them with Christ. And at any rate, why is this ultimately so evil? Because lastly, as Paul says, it's not according to Christ. The false teaching at Colossae seems to have devalued Christ's supremacy and his sufficiency. It taught that the Colossians needed to add and take away things in order to know God and be pleasing to him. It promised spiritual fullness. It may have even offered protection from evil spiritual beings. But the Colossians, and all Christians for that matter, already have all they'll ever need in all of those categories in Christ. So Paul warns them not to be taken captive by this teaching, which is not according to Christ. And he goes on and gives a few reasons, and it's here that he provides a corrective to the false teaching. This is verses 9 to 15. Uh, Starting in verses 9 to 10, he says, For in him, that's Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. Jesus Christ is God. The whole fullness of deity dwells in him bodily. As Hebrews 1.3 says, He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And amazingly, the Colossians, by God's grace through faith in Jesus, have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. Likely they're referring to angels, and in this case, likely fallen evil angels. Now, do you see what this means for them? The false teaching seems to have promised greater spiritual fullness. But since the Colossians have been filled in Christ, in whom the fullness of deity dwells, they already have all the fullness a person can possibly have. There's no more fullness to gain. They don't need to look outside of Christ for that. It would be disastrous to do so. And further, they don't need to fear spiritual beings. Christ is the head of all rule and authority. He didn't create it evil. He didn't create evil angels, but he did create them. And and since the Colossians are in Christ, the head, the creator, they're safe. Paul continues in verses, in verse 11, he says, in him, as Christ, also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Now in the Old Testament, Circumcision was the sign God gave male Israelites to signify that they and the women with them were God's covenant people. But he's writing to Colossians, to a group of Gentile or non-Jewish Christians who wouldn't have received this physical sign. They wouldn't have received the physical mark of circumcision. So what's Paul getting at here? Well, He could be explaining to them that in Christ, in in his circumcision, in Christ's circumcision, which could refer to Jesus' death, 
they have been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. By grace, through faith in Jesus, they have been spiritually circumcised and adopted as God's people. They're no longer on the outside. They're in. If the false teachers were in any way requiring circumcision as a means of spiritual growth, which, to be clear, it's, it, it's not clear that they were, but if they were, this would have been such an encouraging corrective for the Colossians to hear. They've been spiritually circumcised. They're part of God's covenant people. But it may have also been encouraging in that Paul could be referring here to their spiritual circumcision in which the body of flesh, which could refer to their sinful inclinations, was put off. If that's the case, it's possible that the false teachers were advocating circumcision to the Colossian Christians as a means to conquer their sinful fleshly desires. And if so, Paul corrects that. Listen to R.C. Lucas explain it. He says, Paul well knew how the young Christians at Colossae would be longing for freedom from the pull of the flesh. He also knows how to he also knows how open this will make them to false promises of just such a freedom from the flesh that may be offered to them. In this new work of God was offered a purification from the body of flesh. In short, the new teachers may well have been offering what has often been called the clean heart. Now Paul's striking answer is that the Colossians already possess the only purification of which Christ is the source. This circumcision without hands, in other words, uh, an inward experience, is theirs already in Christ. The circumcision of Christ is the purification he gives. This purification is none other than the forgiveness of sins, the great blessing of Christian initiation, evidently disparaged by the visitors, but celebrated by Paul throughout this letter. Such good news for them. And Paul continues in verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Baptism is the outward sign expressing the inward reality of spiritual circumcision. Baptism is the outward sign expressing the inward reality of spiritual circumcision. It signifies that the Colossian Christians are united with Jesus in his death and resurrection. Their old self with its sinful desires is gone, dead and buried. They have been raised to new life with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. Again, no new teaching, no additions to Jesus are needed. The Colossians have all they need in Christ. They are united to him. What is his is theirs. Look now at verse 13. The good news just keeps on coming. Paul assures the Colossians that they, who once were spiritually dead in their trespasses and the uncircumcision of their flesh, that God has made them alive with Jesus, having forgiven them all their trespasses. And how did God do this? Verse 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against them with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Monetary debt can be debilitating, and it can be so freeing, as many of you may know, to get out from under its weight. There's a reason that some people joyfully announce when they are finally debt-free. Paul says here that the Colossians and all of us have accumulated a spiritual debt through our sin. We have a massive, cosmic, infinite IOU with God that we can never pay off. What's the good news then? God, he didn't just sweep that under the rug and ignore it. No, he can't do that. Instead, Jesus, God the Son, died on the cross to pay our debt in full for everyone who would turn from their sins and trust him. On the cross, through Jesus' death on behalf of everyone who would trust him, God canceled our debt. It is paid in full. 
The Colossians needed, they needed to rejoice in that and not look elsewhere for means to be made right with God, and so do we. Jesus paid it all, as we sang earlier. He paid it all. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Such good news. And wonderfully, there's more. Verse 15, Paul says, He, God, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, God triumphed over his enemies. Like a Roman general returning from war with defeated enemies following behind him in his wake, so God defeated, put to open shame, and triumphed over evil spiritual beings. For the Colossian Christians and for those of us who are following Jesus, that means there's no need to be in fear of the devil or his minions. Why? Because through the cross, God stripped them of their power to accuse us, to condemn us. Through Jesus' death, there's no one left to fear because we have no more sin left to condemn. Our debt has been paid in full. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Yes, Satan is an enemy that we must resist. He would love to see us sin against God and each other and abandon Jesus. But we must remember as we seek to resist him and flee from him, we must remember and celebrate that he is a defeated enemy. The serpent has been defamed. The victory is ours in Jesus. So step back and consider why all of this, verses 9 to 15, why this is so encouraging. David Garland puts it well. He says, in 2, 9 to 15, Paul affirms that salvation comes only through Christ, something emphasized by the repetition of the prepositional phrases, in him, Christ, and with him, Christ. All the fullness of deity dwells in Christ, and in him, believers have been given the fullness of salvation through his death and resurrection. There is nothing we can do or need to do to achieve it for ourselves. No self-imposed discipline, solemn rites, or otherworldly visions which we'll get to later in the chapter, will make us fuller members of the community of the saints, will deliver us more fully from their sins, or will more, more fully secure a better hope. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The false teaching at Colossae may have talked about Jesus, but it didn't go all in with him. It seems to have pointed people toward practices to give them greater fullness, to make them more like God, to better protect them from evil beings. Paul is telling the Colossians and us to run from that mess. If you have Jesus, you have all of God. If you have Jesus, you have the head of all rule and authority. He is yours. If you have Jesus, you have been spiritually made new, made a part of God's people. If you have Jesus, you are united to him in his death, burial, and resurrection. If you have Jesus, your sins are forgiven, your debt has been paid. If you have Jesus, no one, not even the devil himself, can condemn you. He has been stripped of his power to accuse you. Your sin has been paid for. There is no condemnation left for you. God is for you now and forever. I hope if you're hearing that this morning and if you're not a Christian, that it is encouraging to you or at least thought-provoking that in Christ, through him, because of his life, death, burial, and resurrection, we can be forgiven and made right with God. So if you're not trusting Jesus, I would encourage you, consider these things. Think deeply about these things and turn away from your sin and come to Jesus with empty hands, with the empty hands of faith, and ask him to save you and be your king. He will. He's ready and willing and able to do that right now, today.
if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me. You can get in touch with me through the contact information on our website or by sending us a message or, or leaving a comment on Facebook. But make no mistake, if the Colossians, if we who are trusting Jesus abandon this hope, if we abandon the good news of the gospel of Christ Jesus, our Lord, if we try to add something to Jesus as if he's not sufficient, we lose him. Adding anything to Jesus takes away from Jesus. That's why this false teaching is so dangerous. Now, in verses 16 to 23, Paul gives two more warnings and corrections. Let's look at those. The first is in verse 16. Paul says, Therefore, because of what he said in verses 9 to 15, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Apparently, the false teachers were judging or perhaps condemning the Colossians because of what they drank and what they ate, possibly looking to Old Testament dietary laws or even simply demanding that the Colossian Christians must refrain from things like meat and alcohol. So it seems like they might be being condemned because of what they drank or what they ate, and also because they didn't observe particular calendar events, a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath, all of which are associated with Judaism. Paul provides the correction in verse 17. He says, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The dietary laws and holidays in the Old Testament pointed forward to Jesus. To demand that Christians observe them now, to judge or condemn others based on their adherence to them, is to devalue Christ, to offer up another gospel. Listen to R.C. Lucas sum this up. The essential claim of the visitors was to fill out the understanding and experience of the young Colossian Christians. In terms of verse 17, this means that their teaching was a practical denial of the truth that the substance belongs to Christ. A practical denial, notice. For we have no reason to suppose that these teachers did not speak well of Christ. How else could they have won a respectful hearing at Colossae? Nevertheless, they taught that even though a man was in Christ, for him, fullness had not necessarily come. Paul's answer is radical and striking. What, in effect, he says to the visitors is this. If you are still trying to fill out people's spiritual experience, then you are living as though Christ has not yet come. The false teaching is, is dangerous. It devalues Jesus. The second warning comes in verses 18 to 19. It seems here that a particular person, perhaps, was disqualifying the Colossian Christians based on ascetic practices. Ascetic practices in which one deprives himself or herself of something in order to be more pleasing to God. Or, perhaps in this text, in order to even experience visions, which we'll get to in a moment. So they might have been being disqualified based on ascetic practices, but also, Paul says, worship of angels, which that's difficult to determine what that means. Uh, I am not sure. Uh, it could mean literally worshiping angels, maybe for the purpose of protection, or striving to arrive at a spiritual plane where you worship God alongside angels. At any rate, this person, Paul says, he, he goes on in detail about visions puffed up, it's pride, without reason by his sensuous mind. And what's wrong with this? Paul says in verse 19, not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. The person who is disqualifying the Colossian Christians is not holding fast to Christ Jesus. It's from Jesus, the head, that the whole body experiences godly growth. 
To seek spiritual fulfillment apart from him is to court disaster. You may experience what might look like growth or what might look impressive or what might seem spiritual, but it's not the real thing. It's not the growth that is from God. That only comes by clinging to Jesus. Paul then poses a question to the Colossians in verses 20 to 22. He asks, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. Paul's now asked the question of the, of, of the Colossians themselves. Now remember, Paul's explained that they are united to Christ. They have died to their old way of life. They were buried with him. They have been risen in, 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 in newness, in, in new life. They've died to the elemental spirits of the world, which again could refer to, to evil angels, evil spiritual beings, or it could refer to the, to the elements that, that make up the world, that make up the universe. At any rate, Paul's saying they have died to those things. And if you've died to those things, why do you still submit to regulations? Regulations that are according to human precepts and teachings. They're not from God. They're not according to Christ's. This is, this is the, the, the message of legalism. Eric Raymond, he points that out. He says, the clear teaching here in Colossians is that you are complete in Christ Jesus. To elevate any other standard outside the work of Jesus Christ is to promote an unbiblical standard. It is to make a law that is not binding. So it may be what you eat or drink, what you do on Sundays, or it may be what you wear for clothes, what kind of music you listen to, or whether you have piercings or tattoos, wear a suit or don't on Sundays, or homeschool or not, or whatever. It is to take something that cannot bring or keep your favor with God and make it binding on yourself and others. This is so dangerous, but it is so prevalent. Apparently for the Colossians, legalism still had its pull. And Paul is, is warning against it in the clearest of terms. Why are the Colossian Christians submitting to these things? Now, we do this too, don't we? We have died to the world as Christians, yet we can still be prone to submit to external regulations, patting ourselves on the back uh, and, and thinking that they will make us more pleasing to God. Sam Storms, he unpacks this, I feel like, very helpfully. This is a longer quote, but bear with me. Listen to what he says. There is a sense in which divine grace will always be a threat to human nature. Why a threat, you ask? Because grace undermines our efforts to justify ourselves. Grace runs counter to human pride and that impulse we all feel to boast in our own accomplishments. Grace requires that we defer all praise to God. Grace undermines our best efforts at establishing a list of requirements and prohibitions that we can impose on ourselves and others as the condition on which we gain acceptance with God. Grace demands only one thing, that all glory and honor and credit be given to Jesus Christ for what he has done, not for what we have done. And human nature instinctively hates that. That is why wherever the gospel of grace is preached, legalism rears its ugly head. Once you declare that God has graciously provided everything we need in the person and work of Jesus Christ, you can rest assured that fallen human nature will rise up and protest and try to sneak in somewhere a rule or regulation that we in our strength can fulfill or an observant, observance or ritual that we, without God's enabling power, can perform that will enhance our spiritual standing or gain some reward that will put God in our debt. We need to be on guard against it. We need to be on guard against, against legalism personally in our walk with Christ and corporately as a church. 
It's, it's dangerous. It detracts from Jesus. It leads away from him. It has the appearance of spirituality, of fruitfulness, but it's really lacking. Paul says as much, or similarly, in verse 23, he says, These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What's one reason why we shouldn't go down that route? Because legalism cannot help you. It cannot stop the indulgence of the flesh. The Colossian Christians may have had a good heart. Their heart may have been in the right place. We want to grow in Christ. We want to continue putting off this body of flesh. We want to flee from sin. And, and, and tempted with, with legalistic rules, it's possible that they could have seen in those something appealing, something that they could follow, something that they could complete in order to, to greater uh, and greater please God. But those things may look wise. Those things may look helpful. We may add made-up rules and regulations to our religion, and in following those rules actually look better. But they are, Paul says, of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. In, in my study this week, I ran across one quote. Um, it was Ray Ortland actually, who mentioned it, but it's a quote from Jerome. Uh, listen, to ha- listen to how he phrases this. How often, when I was installed in the desert, I would imagine myself taking part in the gay life of Rome. Although my only companions were scorpions and wild beasts, time and again I was mingling with the dances of girls. My face was pallid with fasting and my body chill but my mind was throbbing with desires. My flesh was as good as dead, but the flames of lust raged in it. Asceticism has no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Where then do we go? What then do we do? How then should we live? Well, listen to this quote from Tim Chester. Uh, This is another one I found in my study, actually from another guy, uh, Eric Raymond. But Tim Chester says this. In Greek mythology, the sirens would sing enchanting songs, drawing sailors irresistibly toward the rocks in certain shipwreck. Odysseus filled his crew's ears with wax and had them tie him to the mast. This is the approach of legalism. We bind ourselves up with laws and disciplines in a vain attempt to resist temptation. Orpheus, on the other hand, played such beautiful music on his harp that his sailors ignored the seductions of the siren song. This is the way of faith. The grace of the gospel sings a far more glorious song than the enticements of sin, if only we have the faith to hear its music. Colossians 2 is playing for us a beautiful song. In Christ, we have fullness. He is ours. In him, all the fullness of God dwells, and we have been filled in him. We are united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. In Christ, we have been forgiven all of our sins. The record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands has been nailed to the cross. It is done. It's paid for. There is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. And in Christ, through him, through what he has done, God has disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame, triumphing over them. We, through Christ, have the victory. There is nothing for us to fear. So what do we do? We walk in Christ. We keep our eyes fixed on him. We continue clinging to him, trusting him, submitting to his kingly rule. So how do you fight legalism? How do you run from some of what's being proclaimed here, it seems, in Colossae? You keep your eyes on Jesus. We focus on him, our head, our savior, our king. We listen to a more beautiful song. Let's pray.
Father, we are so thankful for you and what you have done for us in Christ. You have, by grace, rooted us in him. You have, by grace, or you are, by grace, building us up in him. You are, by grace, establishing us in the faith. Father, help us to, as we received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. Lord, may we be abounding in thanksgiving because of what Christ has done for us and is doing in us. May we run from all kinds of false teaching that would detract from Christ, that would present a new law to follow, a new rule to keep. May we rest confident, secure, hopeful in our great, sufficient, supreme Savior and Lord. And it's in his name I pray. Amen.